Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's podcast, we have a very interesting guest, uh, unique. We haven't had a lot of guests like this, but I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him, you love him, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com, learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great, how are you? Pulse is still normal. Respiration's fine. Um, I want to talk about something we don't talk about a lot, which is note investing. So our guest today is Martin Sines. And Martin is the founder of NoteInvestingMadeEasier.com. Started in 2009 with the vision of creating colleagues one student as, at a time. And he's renowned as a thought leader in the mortgage note investment industry. He's owned and operated multiple successful companies prior to launching Note Investing Made Easy. And a successful entrepreneur and real estate investor for over 15 years. Um, he really knows what he's doing. Martin Sines, welcome. Mark, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. So Martin, um, let's just rewind the tape. How, how did you get into note investing and then teaching others? So um, I started out with, uh, after getting a graduate degree, obtaining a, a corporate job. And I realized pretty quickly that I hated it and I wasn't, I wasn't any good at it. So after getting fired a few years later in 2004, uh, my wife and I were really just uh, rethinking, you know, what, how, how we needed to approach life and, and, uh, and, and kind of do things for ourselves. So we started a small business and um, along the way in the 2000s, uh, we accumulated a, a healthy portion of commercial and residential properties in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, however, um, you know, that what I found with landlording is it just didn't move the needle enough for me. It, it's a great annuity play, but it wasn't it wasn't delivering the desired cash flow to meet my aspirations. So we sold the company um, that we started the small business in 2013. I still own and manage the properties. However, I was really looking for something new to do. And that's when I stumbled upon note investing. And actually in 2013 is when I found note investing. Okay. Um, Scott Todd. So when you're talking about note investing, can, can you like go a little bit deeper with that and, and explain what it is that you're actually investing in? And Sure. So uh, we purchased distressed mortgage notes nationwide and we work with the homeowners to help them stay in their homes with payment plans they can afford while making a profit for myself and our investors. So that's pretty much what I've been doing in a nutshell um, for the past eight, eight, nine years. And so, um, you know, the purchases have, have, uh, have grown in size over the course of, of the years. However, the mission for the organization still has remained the same. We'll buy a mortgage loan whereby the borrower hasn't made a payment in four or five years. We'll work with them, figure out what they can afford. And because we purchased that loan at a deep discount, we're able to make some concessions to help bring them back on track with a financial plan that they can actually afford and keep them in their home while, while delivering a return to ourselves. So if they, if they haven't made a payment in like four or five years, how are they still in the house? That makes no sense to me. It makes no sense in general, <laughs> not just to you, <laughs> but in general. Um, however, banks and hedge funds have allowed this to happen, um, <clears throat> you know, over the course of many years. It's, uh, you know, there, there are, um, you know, there, there are banks that hold this distressed debt on their books. They do internal charge offs. They, they um, you know, pull up these loans and sell them off into the secondary market space, which is where we purchase these loans from. And so um, the timing and such, um, you know, sometimes attributed to the banks having to um, over collateralize those loans to uh, keep them on their books and keep them in a secured, securitized status. Um, there's a variety of reasons why, um, you know, banks just let distressed debt sit on their books and um, also why hedge funds in the secondary space, they actually, uh, some of them are in business to flip this paper versus actually work with the homeowners as, as we do with our company. 
So time can elapse. You know, four or five years can happen in the blink of an eye. Interesting. So, so Martin, could you could you watch walk us through a case study, what you paid for the note, and then how it how it cash flows and how that all works and, and what what's the risk? Yeah. So so the risk is um, obviously uh, when you're performing due diligence, you know, we're looking at a property valuation, lien validity. We're we're delving into the borrower situation and understanding their ability to pay. A, you know, prior to purchasing that asset. However, you know, there are times when you purchase the asset, the bar, the bar decides they don't want to stay. Um, you know, the, the, they may do things to the property upon exit, you know, nothing that a tenant, you know, you know situation, you have nothing that a tenant wouldn't do, so to speak. However, um, when we're note investing, we're looking at properties that have have a higher property valuation in the 150 K plus all the way into the millions. And so that helps protect us against properties getting stripped out, copper bandits and things like that. So, um, but that is one risk that exists in our industry, not understanding, um, title reports, you know, you could, you could, you could get caught on lien positioning. You could get caught on encumbrances, tax lien sales. You know, there are some pitfalls you have to look out for. So the more sophisticated one is with their due diligence process, the more they mitigate risk, probably just like in any other line of business. Make, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So from a number standpoint, can you walk us through just a typical deal? Absolutely. So um, we primarily focus on the junior lean market. Um, that that's our niche. That has been my niche for for many years. Um, I'll just give you the why in two seconds. It's basically in the secondary market mortgage market space. The senior lean mortgages typically are associated to lower fair market value properties, and so banks typically hold those higher dollar properties back more so but in the junior lien space we see um, healthier property values uh borrowers in much better situations to make payments and come back to the table but to give you an example of a, of of a note very typical um you know let's say a hundred thousand dollars is owed as a legal balance on on that on that debt and so you know we may purchase that from anywhere let's say 30 40 thousand and so that that's the discount that we'll pay. And what we'll do, because we have full equity coverage of our position, we will make contact with the borrower, um, work with them to uh, lower the interest rate, get the monthly payment down, figure out what c they can afford comfortably, and then we'll do a loan modification at par. So we'll create a loan modification for 100,000 at whatever interest rate they're currently at, seven, eight percent. And so, um, you know, that's that's the play from an internal rate of return perspective. You know, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, pretty healthy returns on on average if we're doing what we need to do correctly. OK, makes sense. Scott Todd. OK, now I, now I see why they're why we're buying four and five year old stuff because on the secondary market. How like on the secondary market. So I buy the secondary lien and they stop making payments. What am I gonna do? Like bump the first guy off? Like you know, like what what is my recourse if they stop making payments in the secondary market? So when you purchase the loan, you assume all the rights and responsibilities of the original lender. So you can foreclose. You can foreclose in any lien position on a property. If you're fifth lien lien holder, then you can foreclose. So so we'll foreclose subject to the first. And on these loans we're purchasing, we're purchasing loans where they're the first is performing. So they're paying their first, they're paying their taxes, they're paying everyone but us. So we won't, we just want to get into the equation. However, with that said, if they if they're not paying us and we have legal remedies, uh, you know, through foreclosure, to go and force their hand to come to the table and work out a deal with us. And that's that's what we do. So we're we're very compassionate. We um, do everything in our power to work with the bar to get them on their payment, uh, get them to the table with a win win scenario. However, if that's not the case, then we do have to exercise uh, legal remedies at our disposal. So, Martin, and I'm asking because I don't know, but like 
if I go and I foreclose on, um, you know, for, I'm in your position, I'm in the second position, I go to foreclose on the first one. How does that work? Like, because I don't know, like, how does that work when you said, you know, foreclose subject to the, to the first mortgage? What, what happens? The first mortgage was going to come in and say, no, we're, we're going to protect our loan. So they're going to buy, buy me out. Is that what would happen or what, what would happen? So, so you're not actually uh, foreclosing on the first, you're foreclosing on the property. So um, you can go through the whole foreclosure process, uh, take back the property, take back ownership of the property at the sale or sell it third party and uh, everything's subject to the first. So let's say that we take back the property at auction and we take, take back possession of the property. What we'll do is we'll work to um, you know, do cash for keys, help the bar, uh, you know, get get moved from the property. And then we'll sell that property um, through an REO realtor. And and then we'll the first will get paid at settlement. Now, if if the if we sell it to third party at the auction, then then um, the individual that um, purchased that property will be responsible to satisfy the first. Okay, and so then, so let's say that I get it back, I get it back, and then all of a sudden I've got this for, first. Do I have to make the payments on the first? Um, is that just still on the, the creditor? So if you, you, you can, you can or you can't, it's up to you. I mean, it's up to you whether you want to or not. Um, the first has a, the, right, the same right you do to foreclose on the property that you own, that you took back. So, so they can go through the whole foreclosure process and foreclose on you as the junior lien holder now slash owner of the property. I see, I see. So, so Martin, there's, there, there's a lot of moving parts, no? There's a lot of complexity to this industry. It's, it's, um, it's taken, I mean, it, it's taken me some time to get to the point where I have systems in place that I'm very comfortable. They mitigate a lot of risk. You are going to get burnt, you know, still, you know, everyone does, no matter how sophisticated your systems are, um, you know, eight, nine years into this, I'm still learning every day. There are so many nuances to this and, um, you know, coupled with the fact that, you know, compliance is also an ever growing um, factor in the equation as, you know, uh, states and more regulation, you know, comes down the pike. Dod Dodd-Frank, is, is that involved? Um, so I'm referring more towards the um, NMLS. So, so it's a national mortgage licensing um, platform by which uh, cer certain states require various licensing, mortgage, servicer, uh, debt collections, licensing to operate in various states. And so um, there, there is uh, an added level of complexity when, when operating this in the space. But um, you know, so so one just has to be set up with a with a business versus being a novice investor. It used to be you could just be you know dip your toe in the water, buy a few notes here, a few notes there, and uh, make a run at it and see where it goes. But those days are are really no are really behind us given the amount of complexity out there. So who is this right for then? And how much capital do you need to get started? So um, I wrote in, in my third book, Note Investing Fundamentals, uh, the deal flow is king. And that's what I believe in my heart of hearts. And what I see within this industry is it's not about cash or cash flow. And so, you know, one can come in if, if someone's dedicated and, and committed and they have, you know, 50, 75,000, something like that, just to get kind of kick started, you know, they can make their way through this, through, through the process. There's, there's a, there's plenty of people with, with very deep pockets in this industry. So if, if someone just, you know, really mm -hmm. sets themselves up as a business and focuses on, on, on a deal flow, then they'll be fine. So, uh, and I've, I've seen on the flip side, I've seen people, you know, with a few million dollars, um, I'm going to talk to someone in two hours. They, they reached out last night. I get people to reach out with the books all the time. He says, I have a million bucks. I'm ready. I'm ready to do something in the space. And, you know, I, I see that I see people with one, $2 million and they'll go nowhere. 
and it's not because they have one, two million. It's just that's because in many industries, one to two million may buy them their way through. But in note investing, no, it doesn't do well, it. It doesn't cut it. It doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. So the, the deal flow is what cuts it. Education is what cuts it. Yes, yeah, starting with the foundation in place, um, you know, building your if we're talking from a from a, you know, student perspective, someone coming in, becoming a student of the industry, um, learning the fundamentals, forming an identity, getting your due diligence systems down pat, um, you know, getting set up to be an asset manager on the back end where you're doing all the workout and really just putting all the pieces together and you know hiring as you need to hire and doing all those other things as you're running a company building an operations manual all these things that's required to to really just kind of to really be re taken seriously in the space scott todd what are your thoughts you know i think uh i think the the other thing too is, and martin kind of hit on this too is just because you're throwing money at the problem doesn't solve the problem right like i think you also have to have that burning desire he he talked about deal flow you have to have that burning desire we see this over and over and over again mark if you don't have a burning desire you are not gonna like power through the um through, through the challenging parts you have got to have that burning desire without it it's a hard road man it really is I mean, how many people do you meet where, where um, you know, they're, they they want to be a real estate investor, they want to rehab, landlord, whatever, and you ask them why, and when you get to the root of it, they just see the grass is greener the, on the other side. They see they can make money. They're not they're not happy where they're at financially, and they see this as as the way to to cross that bridge, and and that's just not enough. Yeah. So, Martin, what should I have asked you that I didn't ask? I, I think, um, you know, perhaps, um, you know, we, we run we run an income fund. So we have a legacy play that we put in place last year. So up until up until last year, it, it was really just a modification sh operation we were running. So so we'll bring, you know, put 100 distressed mortgages into the funnel and then out on the other end will come payoffs and loan modifications. And then and then we would we would prosper as a result. And so um, what myself and my partner um, that, that, I, that I brought on a few years ago, what we decided is we wanted something more of a legacy play. So we created Bequest Funds, which is a 506C Reg D fund set up for accredited investors. And so we wanted a, a, a fund that would house and manage performing seasoned mortgages that that meet certain underwriting criteria whereby those mortgages in the fund would sit there for 20 30 years paying so then that way we would receive monthly payments in from the borrowers and then we would pay out our investors monthly payments that that equate to eight percent an eight percent annual return so so we feel like we're really capturing both sides of the fence on the distress side where we're helping the homeowners stay in their homes. And then on the Bequest fund side, where we're doing a legacy play for ourselves and our investors, where people can play, park money in there and receive them, receive monthly payments for, for, you know, for the rest of their lives. So the, you know, the, the really the key is on the performing side. Um, you know, one question that, that is, probably weighing on a lot of minds is COVID, right? And, and are people making their payments? That's probably a good question. When you watch the news, all you see is that, um, you know, forbearance requests are up and, and um, you, know, all, you know, all the folks in the media are telling you, just call your mortgage company and tell them you want a forbearance plan. And that's kind of like a popular theme that's out there. Um, but with that said, you know, we do, we do field all calls and we are compassionate and we do, we do walk people through the forbearance process if they need it. But what we're finding is our collectability percentages are above industry standards, which is at 90%. And so we've been, we've all throughout COVID, we've been 92, 93%. And what we're finding, and it's not so much just to pat ourselves on the back, what we're finding is that people are valuing their homes more than they've ever valued, more than we found them to ever value their homes before. So we found the opposite effect of what's, what's out there 
predominantly in the media and that people are fixing up their homes. People are doing their lawns, you know, they're, they're in their home office staring at their, you know, house all day. So um, we we're finding a, a more of an appreciation for their house houses now. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, before we get to the tip of the week, Scott Todd, any final thoughts? I was just say, if you have nowhere else to go, but home, <laughs> all of a sudden, man, that place is even more. That place is even more uh, important to you. Like, makes sense to me. Yeah. Yes. Well, Martin, this has been fascinating, and your mentorship has been invaluable. But now we're going to ask you for your tip of the week a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? Yeah, so so I learned this the hard way, but um, in 2013, I made a commitment to only invest in assets that cash flow and that I have control over. And that's how I live my whole life by the properties I manage, the notes we purchase, the notes we work out. And, and I did it the other way where I invested in tech companies and, you know, things and I had no control over it or, and I'm not technical. So it's just every time I went away from control and cash flow, it always burnt me. All right. Fantastic. Well, Scott Todd, before we get to your tip of the week, I just want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Flight School. Learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Start building that passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents, and have Scott Todd take you up that mountain of land investing quickly, safely, efficiently. He's done it thousands of times. He will be your Sherpa. And guess what? It's guaranteed. You will make back that tuition 180 days or less. Just show us your work. Learn more. Go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training and schedule a call. Thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Hey, my tips for Martin, like maybe you want to buy some uh, GameStop with me. I don't know. Just kidding. Look, here's my tip. <laughs> my tip is uh, this book. My tip is this book. It's called The Psychology. Oh, hold on a minute. I just lost it. There it is. The Psychology of Money. Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness. It's worth a read, Mark. Really? All right. I'm on it. Um, buying now. Morgan Housel. Wow, it's got 4,907 ratings. A lot of people have read this thing. Holy cow. How come I've never heard of this? Well, because we just gave us the tip of the week. That's why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Now, now I have. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about Martin and his strategy. Go to noteinvestingmadeeasier.com. I love that. Noteinvestingmadeeasier.com. We'll have a link to it, and um, you can learn more there. Martin, are we good? Yes. I appreciate things. I appreciate you guys having me on, Mark and Scott. No problem. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right. I want to thank the listeners. Just remind them the only way we're going to get the quality guests like Martin Signs is if you do us three little favors. You got to subscribe, rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you the $97 wholetailing course, how to double your money, 30 days or less for free. So please do it. All right, let's do this. One, two, three, let, let freedom, freedom, freedom ring. ring. <laughs> Got it. All right, not bad. All right, thanks, Martin. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Read and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.